Greetings. Thank you for being here on this Sunday night. We know that you have lots of options of what you can do on Sunday night, and you end up coming here to be with us, and we're so happy. We have Christmas trees up, and it's a good season, you know? Bring your ornaments to put on the tree, because it's a family tree, so um, my kids would not let me bring any of their, you know, Spider-Man and Elsa uh, ones, but, you know, we'll get there. Um, We are talking about Advent, and I was going to bring up a calendar, but that was a crazy calendar, man. It was like pop-up. Anyway, um, if you've seen Advent calendars, they're counting down to Christmas, and they usually have a piece of chocolate or something that's kind of silly in them. You can get the, the cool ones that you can put a little treat in or some sort of scripture in or all sorts of things every day leading up to Christmas. And so we want to talk, we're starting off tonight on a theme of Advent leading up to Christmas. And so I'm going to explain to you what all of it means, because as you know, we are not a highly liturgical church, which means we're kind of informal, we kind of just do what the Spirit's leading, but it is nice every once in a while to kind of have a little bit of liturgy in what we do, and so we're going to be doing that the next few weeks. So tonight we're talking about hope, and we'll deal with a different theme each week. So what is hope? It's kind of a broad word, right? We say, I hope I get that job. I hope my wife doesn't leave me. I hope they still have pumpkin spice lattes. I hope I make something of myself. You know, like, I mean, there's like a million different ways that we hope for different things. But what actually is it? Webster's Dictionary says it is, it is to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or be true. So if we believe that, we think of hope just kind of like, I really want something to happen. But actually, there's a, a much broader, much more beautiful meaning of hope, many of them, which we're going to talk about tonight. Not surprisingly, right? It's got to be more than that. <laughs> so we're going to dig into it tonight. First, I want to tell you a little bit about Advent, in case you're not familiar with this, um, this kind of season. So Advent is the season leading up to Christmas. The word, the word literally means, Advent, is the coming of a notable person or event. So the advent of something or of someone is anticipation for their coming. And obviously, during Advent, we are anticipating, we're we're putting ourselves, there's twofold, we're putting ourselves back in the position of the Jews before Jesus came, with all those thousands of years of waiting for the Messiah, the anticipation, the expectation of the one who would come and change everything, right? And we're also remembering that we still are expecting in Advent his second coming, which is when he's going to come back and make everything really, really right, because obviously he's redeemed stuff, but um, the kingdom here on earth doesn't look like it looks in heaven quite yet. So when he comes back again, he will make everything right again. And so we are expecting and anticipating his second return, his advent, right? So for people who really celebrate advent, it's really solemn. And so um, they would not have red and green up yet. They would not have Christmas trees up. I have a lot of friends who are in the Reformed Church and the Lutheran Church and the Anglican Church, and they're like not doing anything celebratory yet. It's kind of like celebrating Easter before Good Friday. You're not allowed to do it, you know? And so when do they celebrate Christmas? They start Christmas Eve, and then after that is the 12 days of Christmas. You ever heard of those? So that goes actually through Christmas and after. But up until Christmas Eve, they would be celebrating Advent. And the colors are not red and green. They're purple and pink, which are not my favorites. I'm just going to be honest, but hey, that's what you do for Advent. Um, and you'll notice here these, these candles are for hope, peace, joy, and love. Joy traditionally has a light pink candle to kind of illustrate the purity of joy. And then the one in the middle is called the Christ candle, which is lit on Christmas Day. And um, so it's just a beautiful symbol. Next week when you come in, the candle for hope will already be lit and we'll light at the end of it the candle for peace. And it's just kind of a way to sort of every week, all of us can be leaning into one of these themes together, which is kind of beautiful with oikos. Next week, Pastor Matt will be preaching about peace, so you don't want to miss that because it's usually awesome and hysterical, and he's so different. His style is so different than the way I preach. It's wonderful. Um, So the journey of Advent heading toward the arrival of the Messiah, it always begins with hope. Hope is always the first thing it has to start with. And that kind of makes a lot of sense because if we think of ourselves back in the place of the Jews, for thousands of years... They had been reading scriptures about the Messiah. They had been hearing stories about the Messiah. People had been kind of working their way into the lineage of the Messiah, and they're waiting, waiting, waiting for this person who's going to make everything right. And so hope is really, really important as we dig into this for the first thing, because without it, we can't have anything else. It's kind of the jumping off point for peace, joy, and love. So the word hope is used almost 200 times in the Bible, and it's spread pretty evenly between the Old Testament and New Testament. 
But the first place we see this actual word is in the book of Ruth. So we're going to dig into that a little bit tonight. Um, And it's a great place for it because I feel like sometimes when we think of hope, we think of this person like bright and shiny, you know. Um, You've heard the, the phrase fresh off the boat. I mean, the idea hundreds of years ago when people came here on boats um, was, you know, somebody new and looking for opportunity and usually a little naive about what was going to happen as they leaned into these new, these new frontiers or whatever. It's kind of, I mean, you kind of, I kind of get this sense sometimes that we think hope is just easygoing, sort of immature, hasn't really hit anything hard yet, what we call D1, which is the first stage of a disciple, which is basically blissful ignorance. It's, it's a beautiful thing, but you know it's not going to last, you know? But that's not what hope is. And one of the things I love about finding this word first in the book of Ruth is that there is a very different picture of hope in this book. It gives us this gritty, sort of real, authentic, ugly, ugly, ugly picture of hope, which is what we need because it's not always bright and shiny and we don't always feel happy about everything and we're not always naive. Sometimes we've been disappointed again and again. Sometimes we've been shattered. We feel like our dreams have been shattered. We don't want to hope. And so we need to see the story of someone who's learned how to hope through everything. And so we're going to look at Naomi. Now, first of all, this story happens in the time of the judges. It's not a pretty time for Israel. There's a cycle going on in the book of Judges where it's like the people disobey and then they they get punished and God brings some oppressing other people group to hold them down and then they cry out to God and repent and then he delivers them through a judge. And then they forget and they go back into the cycle again. It's a cycle over and over again in Judges. It's an ugly time. There's some amazing lights in the midst of it, but like not always, you know, not all the way through. Are they actually learning how to obey God? Second, there's a famine in Israel at this time. And in Bethlehem, which ironically the word means house of bread, So in Bethlehem, that city, there's no food. There's no bread. There's no nothing. And in the Old Testament, famine is often associated with God's judgment, and especially in places like Judges, and especially in this place, because when the famine is lifted in verse 6 of Ruth 1, he basically says, the Lord blessed his people by giving them good crops again. So it's likely that he brought the famine because they were in one of these cycles of not obeying him. So all of this stuff, it's not a good backdrop for what happens with Ruth and Naomi and this whole story. Now let's look at the family. Naomi's husband, his name was Elimelech, and he migrates, which is one of the more obvious signs of desperation. When you have an entire extended family network, an entire oikos, you hear us say here all the time, you don't get up and move unless you have to. And so they're desperate. It's particularly telling his name. He is an Ephrathite which is a line of old wealth. So think about like the Rockefellers, you know, or someone like that in the U.S. who you know generation after generation has had lots of money. And um, they're going to keep having lots of money because people who have lots of money know how to use lots of money and make the money work for them, and so they're never going to run out. That's the kind of family that Elimelech comes from. We know that because um, of the family name, but also... When Naomi comes back and she tells everybody, I kind of lost everything. They're like, what? How'd you lose all that? You know, it's kind of like, no way. This can't happen, have happened to you. You're from this family. You're from this oikos that has this status and prestige and money. Also because she's related to this really wealthy man, Boaz, who we see later in the story, which she wouldn't have been if they hadn't had money. And just because she's able to buy back the land. So we see her come back and she has the opportunity to buy back land that's kind of like really, she can't do it because she doesn't have the money, but she could. She has the opportunity to do that. So we know that they're a really wealthy, well-off family in general, but because of this famine, they're destitute. And so they pick up, Elimelech picks up and moves to Moab where there's food. And he takes Naomi, his wife, and his two sons. So when they get to Moab, they've got a new start, new opportunity, and then Elimelech dies. And I, we, cannot, we cannot even conceive of the sort of place that a widow in the ancient Near East in this day and time would have been in, the kind of position she would have been in, the sort of place of vulnerability and, and poverty and loss of status when her husband dies. We, we can't even conceive of it because we have no idea of what that's like. It's still like that in the Middle East in a lot of places. Now what is she going to do? Well, at least she has her sons, right? At least she has people to care for her. At least she still has a family. They get married to two Moabite women, and they die, all right? 
So now there's these three women, Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, by themselves, no children as far as we can tell, vulnerable. Let me tell you, when you're off somewhere by yourself without an oikos, now we're used to it. We pick up, we move around, we go out on our own. We're so foolish in the West. We think we can live life without people around us. We think it's normal, but this was not normal because they couldn't survive without an oikos. So here they are by themselves, three women with no way to make money, no way to provide for themselves. Remember what an oikos gives you? What does an oikos do? Provision and protection. You got it. Provision and protection. And they have no provision or protection because they have no extended family network around them. So Naomi hears that there is food back in Israel, which is a blessing because it means God has, you know, they've cried out to God or something, you know. Some other cycles happen. They're probably going to turn away from him again. But right now they're responding to God. And because he's gracious and compassionate and loving and he loves to love his children, he lifts the famine and there's food again. And she decides to go home because she has nothing else. And why not go back to the place that she used to live and see if she can reestablish relationships or if someone there will care for her? Her daughters-in-law are from Moab. And so she says, hey, there's nothing for you here. Go back to your families. Go back to your oikos. You are really vulnerable by yourselves or sticking around with me. Go back to your families. Maybe you can get remarried. Maybe you can have a family. There may be really good things in store for you. Not for me. I've lost it all. But you could have a good life. And they, they do this... Um, kind of eastern haggling thing (laughs) they go back and forth they say no and she says yes and they say no and then finally her one daughter-in-law says okay I'll go back home and so Orpah heads home which is perfectly reasonable and what she should do and she probably has a great life we never hear of her again but Ruth says no I am not leaving you and you kind of get the sense that that even beyond her family back home Naomi has become such family to her she's so loyal to her she will not leave even though she probably knows there's nothing for me in Israel I will be a foreigner I have no family I'm probably gonna have to work a really crappy job to make things work and hopefully I don't have to sell my body because that's mostly what women had to do if they had no other way I still am gonna stick with you Naomi because you are my family and so she goes with her and they head back to Israel Now, when they go back to Israel, Naomi is broken. She's not this classy, you know, aristocrat like she was when she left. She has no money. She has no family. And remember, in this day and age, often when you, when it was like you have all these blessings and then they kind of go away one by one, people are like, what did you do to God? I mean, just read the book of Job. What did you do to tick God off? You left here so happy and you come back like that. So she's probably got some judgment weighing on her shoulders. She's going back home thinking, oh, I guess I got to go home. I don't know if you've ever felt like that. (laughs) I guess I got to go move back in for a year, you know, with my family or whatever. This is worse, okay? She has no real place to go. When she goes back home, she has the opportunity to buy land and do all this. She has no money to do it. And so Ruth starts this awful job. The only thing that she can do is basically this like back-breaking work of trying to find food in fields where they've already been harvested. People have already harvested all the crops, and she comes along behind to see if there's anything they've left. So she might work hours and hours to get a little bit of grain and the humiliation of basically begging. This is what their lives look like when they go back. And we see in Ruth 1, 19 through 21, the way Naomi feels. It says, so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So she says, don't call me pleasant. There's nothing about my life that's pleasant. Look around. Call me bitter. And you know what I love? They totally ignore her. (laughs) They don't call her bitter. They call her Naomi. And we'll come back to that in just a second. The power of a community around you who remembers who you are when you forget. Believe me, you will forget who you are. You will forget what you're supposed to be. You better make sure somebody's around to say, no, I'm not calling you that. That's not your name. We'll see it through. And somewhere at the end, there will be hope. So the story continues, and we will preach on Ruth because it's beautiful, and there's amazing things about Ruth. Oh my goodness, she's amazing. And Boaz is amazing, and the whole story is great. But basically, it ends happily, okay? You can read it tonight. It's four chapters long. You can probably read it 
during the reflection time that we have at the end. So read it. It's, you know, 10 minutes or something. But we're going to skip to the end because right now I want to focus on Naomi because this is the story of Naomi, honestly. It, it starts and it ends with Naomi and the middle ground is Ruth and Boaz and all this amazing stuff that happens. But the story is about this woman who, has, who went away full and came back empty and how restoration came to her life. In Ruth 4, verse 13, it says, So Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife, this very wealthy man who has lots of influence, lots of favor, all this stuff, then, and, and godly, very godly. And he slept with her, and the Lord enabled her to become pregnant, which is a huge blessing in this day. And she gave birth to a son. Then the women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord, who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. For he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast, and she cared for him as if he were her own. The neighbor women said, now at last Naomi has a son again. And they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David, who is the ancestor of Jesus. So Ruth became, I mean, Ruth gave birth to the man who was the great, she was, she was David's great grandmother. What? Talk about restoration. I mean, there's so many cool parallels to some of the weird, funky stuff that happened, like, in the, in the patriarch story, like, ugly, nasty stuff. If you read through some of those things, it's like, you know, people sleeping with all sorts of crazy, their father-in-law. I mean, it's, it is whacked, some of the stuff that happens. And the parallels to how this story redeems some of those are absolutely amazing. This restoration, this redemption, this thing that happens to this family where everything is better, there's hope again. But when did the hope happen? At the end, when it all got better, I don't think so. I think it was somewhere along the way. It's not just like all of a sudden we become hopeful because all of our circumstances have changed. Because if they hadn't had hope along the way, none of the circumstances would have changed. Because they molded and moved with God as he was putting this cool thing together. Brene Brown, she's a shame, shame researcher. She's brilliant. And if you have never read anything by her or watched a TED Talk, do it. She started off trying to research wholehearted people she called them. People who feel worthy to receive love and give it. That's a big deal. There's not that many people actually in the world like that, as it turns out. And what she decided to do was in the end not study the how-tos, because the truth is we don't need more information on how to. I mean, how many of us basically know how to use our money decently well? I mean, sure, you can learn some nuances and stuff, but like, don't spend money you don't have, right? <laughs> give a ton, you know, stuff like that. We know it, I mean, we, most of us know what we should be eating and how we should be exercising. Like, it's nice to have, like, very tailored, specific things, but the reality is most of us kind of know what to do, and yet we are one of the most in-debt and obese nations in the world, right? So it's not so much about how to do things. She started to look at maybe the thing we need to look at is why don't we do the things we already know to do? And shame rose to the surface. And she decided, I guess I'm studying shame, because that is the number one thing that gets in the way of just about everything we do to be wholehearted people. And in the midst of it, she also she studies belonging, authenticity, vulnerability, all that stuff. So when she was studying these wholehearted people, these words started popping up everywhere that described them. Words like tenacity, strategic, I can, bulldogging it. And these are actual quotes. Surviving failure, struggle, perseverance. These are just some of the words that started coming up again and again with these type of people. And really, she said, if I'm going to put a word on these people, these resilient people, the word I want for it is scrappy. These are some scrappy people. They are not going to be yanked down and defeated. They're going to get up again and again. And actually, the cool thing is that in the end, it all ended up being about hope. How to be like this all came down to hope. Now, not the springy, joyful, you know, I'm so happy, I have hope for all things. Not that kind of hope, but the real kind of hope, the kind of hope that Naomi was able to recover, which is through struggle. Because what she found out is that hope is not actually an emotion at all. It's not a feeling of positivity. It's not about how we feel. It's about how we think. And it's actually 100% teachable. Because they can measure the level of hopefulness in people. And the ones that have the highest level of hopefulness have been taught by their parents, by their mentors, by their teachers, either explicitly or through their example, 
how to be hopeful. And, and one of the things they found again and again were that three, thing, people that had, three things that people with high hopefulness do is, number one, they set goals. Number two, they cultivate pathways to achieving the goals because you can have a thousand and a half goals, but if you don't figure out how to get there, it's not going to happen. And they have agency, which is a sense of, I can do this. That's like one of the things that kept happening. But the biggest surprise and the thing that just made me go, what? When I kind of heard her teaching on this is the idea that hope is a function of struggle. Hmm. Now, it sounded bright and cheerful and cheery and happy a minute ago. And now we're down to hope being a function of struggle. What that means is without one, you don't get the other. And actually, she found that there are two prerequisites before you can even get to hope, perseverance and tenacity. Now, she is a believer, but she doesn't write as a believer. These are all secular things, but perseverance and tenacity as prerequisites to hope, that sounds biblical to me. That sounds like everything Jesus talks about. That sounds like everything we see in the early apostles do, everything that we see great people in the Bible dig into perseverance and tenacity. The people, listen to this, this is great, okay, don't, don't miss this, okay. You see how excited I am, I'm jumping out of my skin all the time. I'm always like that. But the people who have the highest levels of hope have the most experiences with, ding, 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 Lila's favorite word, failure. The highest levels of hope have the greatest, the most experiences of failure. What? How can you have such high levels of hope when you failed so much? That's the point, people. The failure is what encourages the hope. All right, so let me tell you the story. Brene Brown, she tells a story. This woman is interviewing her, and she is like a, a personality, blah, blah, blah. But she also, on the side, this woman, coaches elite swimmers. And I don't know if you know what a kick turn is, but it's this move where you swim to the side of the thing, and you can touch the side and kick off, or you can do a flip. You know, you've probably seen swimmers do this and kick off. And it's so much faster if you do it right. So she was doing this workshop for these elite swimmers, most of whom are young, you know. And um, she said, here's the deal. Before they can leave the workshop, they have to get five thumbs ups on their flip turns. Now they might do five or they might do 35. They're not leaving until they get five thumbs up. And she said, I thought it was great. They're growing, they're getting better, they're achieving their goals. And then the problem though is the parents. The parents don't like them, doesn't, don't like her doing this to their kids. And so they said, instead of doing this, could you go, Meh, <laughs> when they don't get it right? And so she said, what do you think? And she was like, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. And she said, because of, because of this, I'm just gonna, I guess I'm going to say it out loud for the podcast, but imagine you are trying to get out of practice. You do your best flip turn. Nope. You go back. You start again. You come and you work your hardest and you do your best flip turn. Nope, not it. You go back. You come back. You do a flip turn. Mm -mm. You go back, you do a flip turn. Yeah, you got it. Do you feel what just happened in that second? That is called hope. You don't get hope by somebody giving you a thumbs up every time. You get hope by seeing the thumbs down again and again and then realizing, hold on, I'm, I'm getting that. That's what I mean by failure. We have to fail. We have to hear no. Or if we go, meh, or like, that's great, but just a little better, or worse, you're a great person without them doing it right. How is that setting them up? Because at some point, somebody's going to give them a thumbs down in life. And actually, she found, she's talking to all these Fortune 200 companies, and they're like, you know, our biggest problem is all these young folks who come and work here, and as soon as they get a negative performance review, they call their parents and ask their parents to call their bosses. It is a thing, guys. Millennials in the room, this is what people say about your generation. Because it's none of y'all, but it is your generation doing this. And you know whose fault it is? It's not the kid's fault. It's the stinking parents who will pick up the phone and call their boss and say, let me bail out my kid because I never want them to feel uncomfortable. I never want them to fail. I never want them to have a hard time. And we are not setting people up for this. And I know, I, I actually had a meme created for me this week. <laughs> Oprah, you get challenged. You get some challenge. Everybody gets some challenge. It, it really, I'm an ENTJ, so I loved it. You know, like, that is awesome. That's like a total picture of me. But here's the deal with challenge. Is it fair for me to say, yay, every single time? 
or for your huddle leader, or for your buddy, or for a fellow person in the body of Christ, when you're like, wow, I screwed that up, and they're like, but, but, but good job, because we're so afraid that we're all so fragile that we can't hear a, what is wrong with you? Stop it, smack, you know? When it, it's in the context of love and acceptance and forgiveness, and hey, here's my problems too, we can, we can bear a lot of challenge. I feel like I have a responsibility to say, nope, not yet. Mm, getting better, but not there. Not quite submitted enough for me to send you out to do that. Not really ready to do that thing that you have this big dream and goal to do. Okay, now, now you're getting it. See how that feels? It feels real, right? And it feels hopeful. And we're robbing people of that experience when we don't let them fail. And we're robbing ourselves of that experience when we don't embrace failure, even in small things. She says, one of the things that's happened in our culture is that we're not letting our children have any experiences of failure. No experiences of hard work, failure, more hard work, success. See again how that feels? Oh, I worked so hard on that. I did so poorly. Please just give me an A. Nope. You get a C minus, and you're lucky you got that. <laughs> Go back, do more work, come back. Ah, oh, now you got an A. You know? Why do we run from that? Are our, are our egos so fragile that we can't hear someone we love say, uh-uh. This is the gift that we give to each other within oikos, within true body. I don't mean the kind of church where we show up and we talk a little bit and we head home. I mean the kind of thing that's a family where everybody knows everybody's business. And believe me, as spiritual mama, I have people coming to me all the time asking, how's this person doing? What's going on? I had a dream the other day. I had this thing. And it's awesome because that's the way it's supposed to be. If you lived in the East right now, if you were an Indian family, let me just tell you right now, everybody knows your business. We're the only people in the West who think, I should do this by myself. Now let's look at Romans 5, 1 through 5. Paul says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand. Wow. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings. Not I rejoice in my house all by myself, which is hard enough to do by myself. No, no, no. I bring it into the body, and we all rejoice in our collective sufferings. Remember, everything is collective. Everything is community. Nothing is individual in this book. And we need to start pretending like it is. We, we, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Hope does not put us to shame. Why would it? We've already failed a bunch and learned that we're not a failure just because we fail. I mean... I am, blank, is covenant stuff, right? That's who I am. That's not going to change. I did this. That's kingdom stuff. Sure, we can fail. We can fail all day long. That never makes us a failure. God knows exactly who we are. Once we, once we take those things apart and we say, I could fail all day long. In fact, you know me. I'm like, who's failing? Raise your hand. You're the cool kids. Somebody needs to fail at something because until we fail, we're not trying anything that we don't already know how to do. And that doesn't sound like gospel to me. So, hey, if you're like, I don't really like knocking on doors of Keystone employees who are probably high, and most of them are when we knock. <laughs> we, last year we took the kids, and Chase knocks, and he's standing there like three years old. He's like, would you like some cookies? And they're like, looking around like, am I the only one seeing this? Like, seriously, they were like, okay, there's a child at my door handing me cookies. If you're uncomfortable with that, then go. You might bumble, you might fail. People, <clears throat> Keaton... Played the keyboard up here. It wasn't the first time, one of the first times you led worship with the keyboard. Now, he plays about 62 instruments, and he's much more comfortable on the guitar, as you have seen him millions of times. And, and I have been the burr under his saddle to say, Keaton, I want to hear you on the keyboard, because it's like angels come and start singing songs, and the tree lights up in different colors, and amazing things happen. But I've never done that. 
And tonight he did for the first time. And I'm not going to say you failed because my goodness, boy, but I'm just saying you feel a little uncomfortable with it. I mean, so you were like slightly under Juilliard standards, maybe, you know. Um, So the first time you try something and you're really good at stuff, maybe you don't fail quite as hard. I would have failed, you know, big time. Um, at that. But the first time you do something, you're not going to feel great. You're not going to feel competent. You know why? Competence has to be built through lots and lots of failure. G.K. Chesterton, you all know the quote by now. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Or Eric's version, suck until you don't. You're just going to suck for a while. You're just going to be bad at it. I mean, I was encouraging someone recently who was like, wait, I just got into a huddle. I'm going to be leading one one day. And I'm like, you're going to be awesome. You're going to be legendary. I mean, not at first. We all stink at first. Like, (laughs) good grief. You don't want to see my first couple of huddles. Eventually, when you get past the sucking part, you're going to be awesome. (laughs) And that's where hope, you find hope. I just failed at something. But you know what? I think I can keep doing it. Now, we want the hope that will not lead us to shame. But do we want the things that we have to have before that? Because we want hope. Hope is the big thing, right? But remember what leads to hope? Character. And remember what leads to character? Endurance. And remember what leads to endurance? Whoo, suffering. What? When do we start talking about hard stuff? We don't get the good without the bad. We don't get the easy without the hard. We need to start with the struggle. Some of you guys will remember this story. Um, A little over a year ago, I preached a sermon called The Struggle's Supposed to Be Real. And, um... It's about, it says this, a man spent hours watching a butterfly struggling to emerge from its cocoon. It managed to make a small hole, but its body was too large to get through it. After a long struggle, it appeared to be exhausted and remained absolutely still. Still. So the man decided to help the butterfly, and with a pair of scissors, he cut open the cocoon, thus releasing the butterfly. However, the butterfly's body was very small and wrinkled, and its wings were all crumpled. The man continued to watch, hoping that at any moment the butterfly would open its wings and fly away. Nothing happened. In fact, the butterfly spent the rest of its brief life dragging around its shrunken body and shriveled wings, incapable of of flight. What the man, out of kindness and his eagerness to help, had failed to understand was that the tight cocoon and the efforts that the butterfly had to make in order to squeeze out of that tiny hole were nature's way of training the butterfly and of strengthening its wings. If you've ever seen this, it takes hours and hours for a butterfly to emerge from a cocoon. And it's painful for those of us who are like, get her done. What you waiting for? What in the world? Can I just, can I, you know, when I complete people's sentences, you know, I'm like, because you're so slow. Um, that's what we're like with this thing. And this guy, he's trying to be nice, but guess what? Billions of butterflies emerge from their cocoons every day without our help, right? And so he cuts this thing open and he de- deprives it of the struggle. And the struggle is what pumps blood into that thing's body and into its wings so that when it finally emerges, it's strong. But because he let, him, he let this little butterfly, he encouraged and forced this little butterfly to not have struggle, it didn't, it could never fly. Now, what does hope look like in Oikos? Because this is the point that we say, here's how you can have hope in three easy steps, singular, each of you individually as you go throughout your lives. And you know we don't do that here. She says, Brene Brown says that hope can be collective, but we have to do both together. We have to do the struggle part together and we have to do the positive thing at the end together. We can't do one by ourselves. We can't do any of it by ourselves. She says, when hope brings people together, it brings them together from a place of struggle through hard work to achievement. And you know what we don't like doing? We don't like showing people what's going on when we're in the middle of it, right? You know how many times I've heard somebody who's like, man, I was going through a hard time a week ago, but I'm good now. Like, why didn't you call me a week ago? Because we don't want anybody to see us in the midst of our struggle. We run away. Oh, yeah, we were about to get a divorce a month ago, but now we're good. Now I can come back in and tell everybody the story. What? (laughs) You think maybe somebody could have, like, prayed with you? Maybe we shouldn't try to go through the struggle on our own. Maybe we should bring those things in and actually learn to trust one another so that we can have hope for each other. Because sometimes you don't have hope for yourself. Somebody else has it for you. That's what family is for. Remember how the community changed Naomi's life. The women who sing her name are at the beginning and they're at the end. They're like bookends to say, you forgot who you are, but we're going to sing your name and you're going to learn that even though in this place right now you have no hope, you can't see who you are, you can't see what's going to happen, we know. 
we know. And that's what happens in community. And so even something as individualistic as hope is not. It's communal. And we need to borrow from each other and we need to contribute to each other. And if we have too much one day, we need to go find someone who doesn't have enough because it's not about us getting through this life and having everything we ever dreamed of and having all of our hopes and dreams fulfilled. It's about the kingdom of God coming from heaven to earth and that's not going to happen if we do any of this stuff on our own. 